Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan, and I'm talking XRP. Always, I'm looking at the different use cases out there because at the end of the day, if we don't have any investor speculation, which seems to be very soft right now, well, then we really need to depend on the use case and everything else to me just doesn't matter as an XRP holder. So this is very laser focused, this channel. And today I went ODL hunting, which is using the digital asset XRP. And it is one that makes the on-demand liquidity work. And there's a new video that was uploaded today. This is the SCB Easy Transfer International Funds Easier and Faster Than Ever with the blockchain via RippleNet. This is coming via Bertai, and it's about how to use the Siam Commercial Bank in Thailand, who is a RippleNet member, how to use their international money transfer mobile app. That app is called SCB Easy. And it's interesting that they highlight, well, among the 12 countries and four currencies, the US dollar, the pound, the euro, and the Singapore dollar, there is kind of special talk about two corridors. And those are with the countries that are in England and Singapore. They say here that they are the fastest they complete the transfer in 30 seconds, 24 hours a day. I think it's safe to say that these two corridors are going to show up very soon with on-demand liquidity, both according to General Counsel Stu Alderati at Ripple. He says that the uh, country of Singapore and the UK have very clear uh, regulations. So it's nice to see that some countries are moving ahead despite some of the other countries dragging their feet. Today, the Singapore authorities officially demonstrated that they're very open to crypto in payments. Yubin, this Yubin network, which they've been testing since 2017, I believe, now has the official green light. It's in the commercial deployment stage and it integrates with other blockchain platforms, including permission DLT solutions like Ripple. And it will allow those other solutions to leverage off of its multi-currency payment network. A breakthrough, not only in Asia, but I think for the entire international fin fintech sphere. Uh, new companies that are creating blockchain-centric uh, um, in focus, Singapore is number one and Japan is number two, according to this article. So it's another example of the US really needs to get hurrying up here. Anybody who says that they are not behind, I don't know who they're listening to because it's just getting faster and faster in terms of the development and the progress and they seem to get just further and further behind. Today, I also found a 25 minute video where Ripple senior product manager, Warren Paul Anderson, gives us a very good view of how the interledger technology can be used to develop new ways to transfer value. There's two very interesting stats in this video. And of course, I'm kind of uh, stat crazy. The first one is at the five minute and 55 uh, second mark. This is about checks. I just, this, this just kind of took me by surprise. Have a listen. Um, so there's a lot of ways, you know, you can pay it, Interestingly enough, there was over 7 billion checks that were actually written, uh, written actually just last year. So people still write checks. I had to write a check a couple of weeks ago. I didn't have a checkbook, uh, but that was the, the payment method that the merchant accepted. So I had to go find a check, pay the bank like $5 just to print out a piece of paper with my account information on it. Um, but that's kind of been the state of the world. Uh, so I was just shocked to hear that. You know, I've been out of the United States for 20 years and when I heard 7 billion checks, I just did a little bit of research. Like, who is still writing checks? You can't even 
write a check here in Japan. I don't think I've written a check for, I don't know, well over 15 years. I, I just can't even th remember the last time I wrote a check. So when he says that it's just the state of the world, I don't think in Asia there are just not a lot of checks being written on this side of the pond. Essentially, there aren't any. And when I did go into checking, I found that millennials still write checks in the United States, that uh, millennials are still leading writing checks over video game council, councils, which is 34%, and the millennials who stu, still write checks are 42%. I don't know why, I'm just just kind of taken aback by this one. Okay, the other stat I thought, oh, in, in addition to that, I did check that I can find the Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corp for foreigners will create a remittance check. They charge 7,000 yen. That's a little over $65 to, <laughs> to make an overseas remittance check. Yeah, I think that would stop that process pretty quick. All right. So going to that other stat that I found interesting. This is, this is truly interesting when it talks about how just 1% in digital payments can equate to a hundred billion in GDP. And there's a lot of countries that need to increase their GDP, their gross domestic product. And how is that usually done? Well, usually it's done by spending and taxing. And that can mean like increased hours worked or it could mean investments and it's basically your national output all right so just have a listen to this that is just this this figure just blows me away so we've seen actual research that shows that for every one percent increase in digital payments the world gdp increases by a hundred billion dollars that's just unbelievable. So a hundred billion dollars for every one percent. The U.S. has a twenty trillion GDP, but the hundred billion for GDP in terms of countries that could be like the size of Ecuador or the size of Puerto Rico or the size of Cuba. That is just unbelievable. Anyway, if you are new to the uh, space and you want to know uh, some really great information in regards to the uh, Interledger Protocol and XRP and what the Spring Arm is doing with um, promoting that to some 20 million developers around the world. This is a fantastic video. I'm going to put a link to it in the description below. Okay, the best piece of perspective that I found was in this video. It was uploaded today, July 16th, and it comes from the Center for Study of Financial Innovation. And there are two people you're going to hear speaking. That is Tony Craddock. He's the Director General of the Emerging Payments Association and Sandra Alzetta. She's the VP of Global Head of Payments at Spotify. And before she was with Spotify, she spent 27 years with Visa in the digital services. Listen to this. This to me is one of the best finds I found today. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go to my Twitter because I really got lucky after I tweeted that out. UKXRP put it in a clip for me. Um, that was really helpful because he just uh, zeroed in on the most important part of that video. Okay, listen to this. What's the biggest change coming down the pike in the payment system? I'm going to ask uh, Sandra and Ruth after you. What do you, what do you put your money on? That's really, on? really unfair. Normally, I'd like to be asked third rather than first. Um, uh, biggest change will be... Um, the uh, the impact of uh, the crypto uh, world on payments, uh, working behind the scenes to improve the way in which systems work. Sandra? 
Yeah, I think I would agree with Tony. I think it's got the potential to to genuinely disrupt. Um, and also, I'd agree with Tony, this isn't going to happen overnight. These things never do. People get very excited about new innovations and expect to see them laying eggs in you know, a year or two years. I can't think of a single payments innovation that's moved quickly uh, because it actually needs to go through regulation and so on and take people on the journey, take uh, merchants on the journey. Um, but what we have seen is that when things do take off, they absolutely take off. Um, so uh, let's see what happens. I'm excited. Ruth, the final word is with you. Thank you, Andrew. So it's really the technology that has been so dominant in changing the way we operate in the payment space. And this has spilled over to regulators and central banks, which is why we have central bank digital currency initiatives and other things. So I truly bet on the foundational nature of some of these new technologies, call it distributed ledger, call it cloud, call it edge. It's an amalgamation of these elements designed in a way that it will work for the institutional space, the regulated space, rather than the private crypto space, that will give us the answer in the interplay of businesses, finance, and the bank and the regulatory community. And I think that's going to be the group that will make it happen, and it will take time, but it will truly change the way we think about money and value, and it will also digitize all the assets with it. The scary bit is that we're really talking about changing our view of money, just not uh, not just our view of payments. Absolutely. Can I thank, can I thank Tony? Can I thank Sam? Yeah, great, right? That was just golden. The biggest change coming. It's that crypto, the DLT, the cloud. It's how it's going to impact payments behind the scenes. It's great. I just love it. I, I just found that this is uh, from people who really know the space and they're not hyping it. It's going to take time. But all of them agree this is going to be the biggest change coming. All right, everybody, we are going to jump to some fluff. I am going to, let's see, what should I show you? Yeah, I'm going to show you first, which I have been finding on a daily basis of how the new norm is and what this current global situation is creating in terms of <laughs> new products. And this is one that's incredible. It's a pop-up private space and it does so for just like 60 US dollars. Um, it's actually a little less than 60 US dollars. It's available on Rock 10, which is like the Amazon of Japan. But it is, you know, there are there are just uh, the spaces within the living environment here in Tokyo. The um, space is very small. And so I think people feel like they don't have any privacy in this stay at home um, initiative. And uh, this is just such a simple, great solution for being able to create your own private space. And you can do so even with like a moon roof. <laughs> Look at this. But if you're studying, if you are wanting to just have your own space to uh, play games, uh, work, enjoy, relax. I mean, I think this is just really great. And look at that. It literally just pops up there. It just, it just poop. You just open it and voila, there you go. It's called the Zestrenser. <laughs> I love this product. All right, we are going to then have a take a, yeah, we're going to take a look at a live shot here. This is Tokyo. This is the Rainbow Bridge. And you're looking across the uh, Tokyo Bay. This is Shibaura over here. This is uh, Minataku, which is the um, southwest section of the city. This is Tokyo Tower. Um, there is no m downtown to Tokyo. It is 100% in the round, 360 degrees all the way around. So you're just seeing a little sliver of a very, very big city. But what I noticed, there was a reason why I went to look at the live cam because the numbers are on the increase here in Tokyo. And um, Koike-san, who's the governor, she likes to turn the, bri the bridge red when she elevates the level of 
warning. So I went to go look uh, because the numbers were very high today to see if she had changed the bridge to red. And no, nope, it's still in a um, another color. It changes. It's called the Rainbow Bridge. So it's always changing colors. But um, no red, which is good. I'm happy to see that. But one thing I noticed is there are no yakata bune. And the yakata bune are such a part of Japanese culture. Let me just show you here. This is, this is a ukiyo-e print that is from the Edo period. So somewhere between the 1600s and the 1800s. And it shows how the Japanese have been enjoying the bays and the rivers on the water with these boats that are party boats called yakatabune. And actually it, the tradition of, of eating and watching performances, whether it's uh, stage theater or musicals on the water, at, date back all the way to the 700s. It shows up in some poems. This, I believe, is the Nihonbashi, which is the main bridge in um, the old part of Edo where everything was really happening. Look, I don't know if it's an exaggeration. I don't think so because these ukiyo-e were like a slice of moment in time. It was kind of like a uh, you know, didn't have a camera so that so they would use these ukiyo-e artist to depict life in everyday sense. And I don't think it's, I just don't think it's exaggerated. I mean, there, there are a lot of boats in this part of Japan, which is probably the 1700s, I'm going to guess. Wow. And if it is Nihonbashi, this is a river, a portion of the river that goes through there. Now, here's a picture of the Rainbow Bridge, and it is what it usually looks like when the Yakatabune are out. This is this is high season right now for those Yakatabune, but I'm seeing that the live shot, there just isn't anybody out on the water, which I'm sure these businesses are really suffering and makes me feel sad. It really does. If you look on the bottom of this uh, image, can you see the Statue of Liberty there kind of on the left hand side, but on the bottom, Japan has its Statue of Liberty that was also gifted uh, to them from France. It's a little smaller than the one in the US, but it is exactly the same thing. It was given to them for the world's fair, I believe. Yeah, a gift from France, but it is, um, yep, you might be surprised. Everybody thinks it's so American, but actually um, it was given uh, as gifts from France. And yeah, it sits out there in, in Tokyo Bay. So I was just um, really thinking I should share with you when things do get back to normal and you do come to Tokyo, please try one of these Yakata Bune because they are so fun. This is, this is an example of what one looks like on the inside and you can see you sit on the floor, but uh, some of them have chairs and um, tables, but most of them you sit on the floor and then you, you can put your legs down into a cutout portion down below underneath the table. It's really comfortable, very, very comfortable. And it's, and it's a fun place to go for reunions, business parties, New Year's parties, cherry blossom parties, for fireworks, any occasion, actually. And you don't need a big group. You can go just as a couple if you want. But these boats are um, able to hold like, 70 some people on uh, on just one boat. I'm going to show you that there are 11 places in Tokyo alone where you can board. And I used to live, see this number nine here? I used to live right next to this location. And it is one of the oldest, well, it's not the oldest, but it's one of the oldest. It's family run for the last um, 
90 years out of this location here. It's Ishikawa, the Yakatabune, and they are uh, really, I mean, you, I don't want you to just use this one, although I know this one is great, and you can choose from many depending on where you want to cruise, how much you want to spend, what you want to eat, how you want to sit. So there's quite a selection. But if you are looking for one that takes you out into the um, Tokyo Bay by that rainbow bridge and one that I know is good, well, the Ishikawa family that run these boats are very, very good. This one is, um, Fully equipped, yeah, air conditioning, online karaoke. Uh, they have bathrooms. They can hold up to 73 people. The observation deck on top can accommodate 23 people. And you can do a cruise with food for about 100 US dollars, a little less than that. And then you can go even up from there, depending on what you decide, how long you want to cruise, and the extent of your meal. The meals are really fabulous. I mean, really, you will just thoroughly enjoy what they do for you in terms of food. All right, everybody. Yeah, that's it. Yes, do take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.